Jack the Ripper was an unidentified serial killer active in largely impoverished areas in and around the Whitechapel district of London in 1888. In both the criminal case files and contemporary journalistic accounts, the killer was called the Whitechapel murderer and leather apron. Attacks ascribed to Jack the Ripper typically involved female prostitutes who lived and worked in the slums of the East End of London whose throats were cut prior to abdominal mutilations. The removal of internal organs from at least three of the victims led to proposals that their killer had some anatomical or surgical knowledge. Rumors that the murders were connected intensified in September and October 1888 and numerous letters were received by media outlets and Scotland Yard from individuals purporting to be the murderer. The name Jack the Ripper originated in a letter written by an individual claiming to be the murderer that was disseminated in the media. The letter is widely believed to have been a hoax and may have been written by journalists in an attempt to heighten interest in the story and increase their newspaper's circulation. The From Hell letter received by George Lusk of the White Chapel Vigilance Committee came with half of a preserved human kidney, purportedly taken from one of the victims. The public came increasingly to believe in a single serial killer known as Jack the Ripper, mainly because of both the extraordinarily brutal nature of the murders, and media coverage of the crimes. Extensive newspaper coverage bestowed widespread and enduring international notoriety on the Ripper, and the legend solidified. A police investigation into a series of 11 brutal murders committed in Whitechapel and Spitalfields between 1888 and 1891 was unable to connect all the killings conclusively to the murders of 1888. Five victims, Marianne Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Jane Kelly, are known as the canonical five and their murders between 31 August and November 9, 1888 are often considered the most likely to be linked. The murders were never solved, and the legends surrounding these crimes became a combination of historical research, folklore, and pseudo-history. In the mid-19th century, Britain experienced an influx of Irish immigrants who swelled the populations of the major cities, including the East End of London. From 1882, Jewish refugees fleeing pogroms in Tsarist Russia and other areas of Eastern Europe emigrated into the same area. The parish of Whitechapel in London's East End became increasingly overcrowded with the population increasing to approximately 80,000 inhabitants by 1888. Work and housing conditions worsened, and a significant economic underclass developed. 55% of children born in the East End died before they were five years old. Robbery, violence, and alcohol dependency were commonplace, and the endemic poverty drove many women to prostitution to survive on a daily basis. In October 1888, London's Metropolitan Police Service estimated that there were 62 brothels and 1,200 women working as prostitutes in Whitechapel, with approximately 8,500 people residing in the 233 common lodging houses within Whitechapel every night, with the nightly price of a single bed being 4D and the cost of sleeping upon a lean-to hangover. Ropes stretched across the bedrooms of these houses being 2D for adults or children. The economic problems in Whitechapel were accompanied by a steady rise in social tensions. Between 1886 and 1889, frequent demonstrations led to police intervention and public unrest, such as Bloody Sunday, 1887. Anti-Semitism, crime, nativism, racism, Social disturbance, and severe deprivation influenced public perceptions that Whitechapel was a notorious den of immorality. Such perceptions were strengthened in the autumn of 1888 when the series of vicious and grotesque murders attributed to Jack the Ripper received an unprecedented coverage in the media. The large number of attacks against women in the East End during this time adds uncertainty to how many victims were murdered by the same individual. 11 Separate Murders 
stretching from April 3, 1888 to February 13, 1891 were included in a London Metropolitan Police Service investigation and were known collectively in the police docket as the Whitechapel murders. Opinions vary as to whether these murders should be linked to the same culprit, but five of the eleven Whitechapel murders, known as the canonical five, are widely believed to be the work of Jack the Ripper. Most experts point to deep slash wounds to the throat followed by extensive abdominal and genital area mutilation, the removal of internal organs, and progressive facial mutilations as the distinctive features of the Ripper's modus operandi. The first two cases in the Whitechapel murders file, those of M. Elizabeth Smith and Martha Tabram, are not included in the canonical five. Smith was robbed and sexually assaulted in Osborne Street, Whitechapel, at approximately 1.30 a.m. on April 3, 1888. She had been bludgeoned about the face and received a cut to her ear. A blunt object was also inserted into her vagina, rupturing her peritoneum. She had developed peritonitis and died the following day at London Hospital. Smith stated that she had been attacked by two or three men, one of whom she described as a teenager. This attack was linked to the later murders by the press, but most authors attribute Smith's murder to General East End gang violence unrelated to the Ripper case. Tabrim was murdered on a staircase landing in George Yard, Whitechapel, on August 7, 1888. She had suffered 39 stab wounds to her throat, lungs, heart, liver, spleen, stomach, and abdomen with additional knife wounds inflicted to her breasts and vagina. All but one of Dabrim's wounds had been inflicted with a bladed instrument such as a penknife, and with one possible exception, all the wounds had been inflicted by a right-handed individual. Dabrim had not been raped. The savagery of this murder, the lack of an obvious motive, and the closeness of the location and date to the later canonical Ripper murders led police to link this murder to those later committed by Jack the Ripper. However, this murder differs from the later canonical murders because although Tabroom had been repeatedly stabbed, she had not suffered any slash wounds to her throat or abdomen. Many experts do not connect Tabroom's murder with the later murders because of this difference in the wound pattern. Canonical Five The Canonical Five Ripper victims are Marianne Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Jane Kelly. The body of Marianne Nichols was discovered at about 3.40 a.m. on Friday, August 31, 1888 in Lux Row, now Durward Street, Whitechapel. Nichols had last been seen alive approximately one hour before the discovery of her body by a Mrs. Emily Holland, with whom she had previously shared a bed at a common lodging house in Thrall Street, Spitalfield, walking in the direction of Whitechapel Road. Her throat was severed by two deep cuts, one of which completely severed all the tissue down to the vertebrae. Her vagina had been stabbed twice and the lower part of her abdomen was partly ripped open by a deep, jagged wound, causing her bowels to protrude. Several other incisions inflicted to both sides of her abdomen had also been caused by the same knife. Each of these wounds had been inflicted in a downward thrusting manner. One week later, on Saturday, September 8, 1888, the body of Annie Chapman was discovered at approximately 6 a.m. near the steps to the doorway of the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street, Spitalfield. As in the case of Marianne Nichols, the throat was severed by two deep cuts. Her abdomen had been cut entirely open, with a section of the flesh from her stomach being placed upon her left shoulder and another section of skin and flesh, plus her small intestines being removed and placed above her right shoulder. Chapman's autopsy also revealed that her uterus and sections of her bladder and vagina 38 had been removed. At the inquest into Chapman's murder, Elizabeth Long described having seen Chapman standing outside 29 Hanbury Street at about 5.30 a.m. in the company of a dark-haired man wearing a brown deerstalker hat and dark overcoat, and of a shabby genteel appearance. 
according to this eyewitness, the man had asked Chapman the question, Will you? To which Chapman had replied, Yes. Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes were both killed in the early morning hours of Sunday, September 30, 1888. Stride's body was discovered at approximately 1 a.m. in Dutfield's yard, off Burner Street, now on Reeks Street, in Whitechapel. The cause of death was a single clear cut incision, measuring six inches across her neck, which had severed her left carotid artery and her trachea before terminating beneath her right jaw. The absence of any further mutilations to her body has led to uncertainty as to whether Stride's murder was committed by the Ripper or whether he was interrupted during the attack. Several witnesses later informed police they had seen Stride in the company of a man in or close to Burner Street on the evening of 29 September and in the early hours of 30 September, but each gave differing descriptions. Some said that her companion was fair, others dark. Some said that he was shabbily dressed, others well dressed. Ed Owes's body was found in Mitre Square Inches the City of London, three quarters of an hour after the discovery of the body of Elizabeth Stride. Her throat was severed and her abdomen ripped open by a long, deep and jagged wound before her intestines had been placed over her right shoulder. The left kidney and the major part of the uterus had been removed, and her face had been disfigured, with her nose severed, her cheek slashed and cuts measuring a quarter of an inch and a half an inch respectively vertically incised through each of her eyelids. A triangular incision, the apex of which pointed towards that house's eye, had also been carved upon each of her cheeks, and a section of the auricle and lobe of her right ear was later recovered from her clothing. The police surgeon who conducted the post-mortem upon Ed Owes's body stated his opinion these mutilations would have taken at least five minutes to complete. A local cigarette salesman named Joseph Lawn had passed through the square with two friends shortly before the murder, and he described seeing a fair-haired man of shabby appearance with a woman who may have been Ed Owes. Lawn's companions were unable to confirm his description. The murders of Stride and Ed Owes ultimately became known as the double event. A section of Ed Owes's bloodied apron was found at the entrance to a tenement in Goulston Street, Whitechapel, at 2.55 a.m. A chalk inscription upon the wall directly above this piece of apron read, The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. This graffito became known as the Goulston Street Graffito. The message appeared to imply that a Jew or Jews in general were responsible for the series of murders, but it is unclear whether the graffiti was written by the murderer on dropping the section of apron, or was merely incidental and nothing to do with the case. Such graffiti were commonplace in Whitechapel. Police Commissioner Charles Warren feared that the graffiti might spark anti-Semitic riots and ordered the writing washed away before dawn. The extensively mutilated and disemboweled body of Mary Jane Kelly was discovered lying on the bed in the single room where she lived at 13 Miller's Court, off Dorset Street, Spitalfield, at 10.45 a.m. on Friday, November 9, 1888. Her face had been hacked beyond all recognition, with her throat severed down to the spine, and the abdomen almost emptied of its organs. Her uterus kidneys in one breast had been placed beneath her head, and other viscera from her body placed beside her foot, about the bed and sections of her abdomen and thighs upon her bedside table. The heart was missing from the crime scene. Each of the canonical five murders was perpetrated at night, on or close to a weekend, either at the end of a month or a week, or so, after. The mutilations became increasingly severe as the series of murders proceeded, except for that of Stride, whose attacker may have been interrupted. Nichols was not missing any organs, Chapman's uterus and sections of her bladder and vagina were taken. Ed Owes had her uterus and left kidney removed and her face mutilated, and Kelly's body was extensively eviscerated with her face gashed in all directions and the tissue of her neck being severed to the bone, although the heart was the sole body organ missing from this crime scene. Historically, 
The belief these five canonical murders were committed by the same perpetrator is derived from contemporary documents which link them together to the exclusion of others. In 1894, Sir Melville McNagden, Assistant Chief Constable of the Metropolitan Police Service and Head of the Criminal Investigation Department, SID, wrote a report that stated, the Whitechapel murderer had five victims, and five victims only. Similarly, the canonical five victims were linked together in a letter written by police surgeon Thomas Bond to Robert Anderson, head of the London SID, on November 10, 1888. Some researchers have posited that some of the murders were undoubtedly the work of a single killer, but an unknown larger number of killers acting independently were responsible for the other crimes. Authors Stuart P. Evans and Donald Rumbelow argue that the canonical five is a ripper myth and that three cases, Nichols, Chapman, and Eddowes, can be definitely linked to the same perpetrator, but that less certainty exists as to whether Stride and Kelly were also murdered by the same individual. Conversely, Others suppose that the six murders between Cabram and Kelly were the work of a single killer. Dr. Percy Clark, assistant to the examining pathologist George Baxter Phillips, linked only three of the murders and thought that the others were perpetrated by weak-minded individual S. Induced to emulate the crime. McNaghton did not join the police force until the year after the murders and his memorandum contains serious factual errors about possible suspects. Mary Jane Kelly is generally considered to be the Ripper's final victim, and it is assumed that the crimes ended because of the culprit's death, imprisonment, institutionalization, or emigration. The Whitechapel murders file details and other four murders that occurred after the canonical five, those of Rose Milet, Alice Mackenzie, the Pynchon Street Torso, and Francis Coles. The strangled body of 26-year-old Rose Milet was found in Clark's Yard, High Street, Poplar on December 20, 1888. There was no sign of a struggle, and the police believed that she had either accidentally hanged herself with her collar while in a drunken stupor or committed suicide. However, Faint markings left by a cord on one side of her neck suggested Milet had been strangled. At the inquest into Milet's death, the jury returned a verdict of murder. Alice Mackenzie was murdered shortly after midnight on July 17, 1889 in Castle Alley, Whitechapel. She had suffered two stab wounds to her neck, and her left carotid artery had been severed. Several minor bruises and cuts were found on her body, which also bore a seven-inch long superficial wound extending between and beneath her left breast and her navel. One of the examining pathologists, Thomas Bond, believed this to be a ripper murder, though his colleague George Baxter Phillips, who had examined the bodies of three previous victims, disagreed. Opinions among writers are also divided between those who suspect Mackenzie's murder recopied the modus operandi of Jack the Ripper to deflect suspicion from himself, and those who ascribe this murder to Jack the Ripper. The Pynchon Street torso was a decomposing headless and legless torso of an unidentified woman aged between 30 and 40 discovered beneath a railway arch in a Pynchon Street, Whitechapel, on September 10, 1889. Bruising about the victim's back, hip, and arm indicated the decedent had been extensively beaten shortly before her death. The victim's abdomen was also extensively mutilated, although her genitals had not been wounded. She appeared to have been killed approximately one day prior to the discovery of her torso. The dismembered sections of the body are believed to have been transported to the railway arch, hidden under an old chemise. At 2.15 a.m. on February 13, 1891, P.C. Ernest Thompson discovered a 25-year-old prostitute named Frances Coles lying beneath the railway arch at Swallow Gardens, Whitechapel. Her throat had been deeply cut but her body was not mutilated, leading some to believe Thompson had disturbed her assailant. Coles was still alive. 
although she died before medical help could arrive. A 53-year-old stoker, James Thomas Sadler, had earlier been seen drinking with Coles, and the two are known to have argued approximately three hours before her death. Sadler was arrested by the police and charged with her murder. He was briefly thought to be the Ripper, but was later discharged from court for lack of evidence on March 3, 1891. In addition to the 11 Whitechapel murders, commentators have linked other attacks to the Ripper. In the case of Fairy Fay, it is unclear whether this attack was real or fabricated as a part of Ripper lore. Fairy Fay was a nickname given to an unidentified woman whose body was allegedly found in a doorway close to Commercial Road on December 26, 1887 after a stake had been thrust through her abdomen, but there were no recorded murders in Whitechapel at or around Christmas 1887. Fairy Fay seems to have been created through a confused press report of the murder of Emma Elizabeth Smith who had a stick or other blunt object shoved into her vagina. Most authors agree that the victim Fairy Fay never existed. A 38-year-old widow named Annie Millwood was admitted to the Whitechapel Workhouse Infirmary with numerous stab wounds to her legs and lower torso on February 25, 1888, informing staff she had been attacked with a clasp knife by an unknown man. She was later discharged but died from apparently natural causes on 31 March. Millwood was later postulated to be the Ripper's first victim, although this attack cannot be definitively linked to the perpetrator. Another suspected pre-canonical victim was a young dressmaker named Ada Wilson, who reportedly survived being stabbed twice in the neck with a clasp knife upon the doorstep of her home in Bow on March 28, 1888. A further suspected pre-canonical victim, Annie Farmer, resided at the same lodging house as Martha Tabriman reported an attack on November 21, 1888. She had received a superficial cut to her throat. Although an unknown man with blood on his mouth and hands had run out of this lodging house, shouting, look at what she has done, before two eyewitnesses heard Farmer scream. Her wound was possibly self-inflicted. The Whitehall mystery was a term coined for the discovery of a headless torso of a woman on October 2, 1888 in the basement of the new Metropolitan Police headquarters being built in Whitehall. An arm and shoulder belonging to the body were previously discovered floating in the River Thames near Pimlico on 11 September and the left leg was subsequently discovered buried near where the torso was found on 17 October. The other limbs and head were never recovered and the body was never identified. The mutilations were similar to those in the Pynchon Street torso case, where the legs and head were severed but not the arms. Both the Whitehall mystery and the Pynchon Street case may have been part of a series of murders called the Thames Mysteries committed by a single serial killer dubbed the Torso Killer. It is debatable whether Jack the Ripper and the Torso Killer were the same person or separate serial killers active in the same area. The modus operandi of the Torso Killer differed from that of the Ripper, and police at the time discounted any connection between the two. Elizabeth Jackson was a prostitute whose various body parts were collected from the River Thames over a three-week period in June 1889. She may have been another victim of the Torso Killer. On December 29, 1888, the body of a seven-year-old boy named John Gill was found in a stable block in Manningham, Bradford. Gill had been missing since 27 December. His legs had been severed his abdomen opened, his intestines partly drawn out, and his heart and one ear removed. Similarities with the Ripper murders led to press speculation that the Ripper had killed him. The boy's employer, 23-year-old milkman William Barrett, was twice arrested for the murder but was released due to insufficient evidence. No one was ever prosecuted. Carrie Brown, nicknamed Shakespeare reportedly for her habit of quoting Shakespeare's sonnets, was strangled with clothing and then mutilated with a knife on April 24, 1891 in New York City. 
Her body was found with a large tear through her groin area and superficial cuts on her legs and back. No organs were removed from the scene, though an ovary was found upon the bed, either purposely removed or unintentionally dislodged. At the time, the murder was compared to those in Whitechapel, though the Metropolitan Police eventually ruled out any connection. The vast majority of the City of London police files relating to their investigation into the Whitechapel murders were destroyed in the Blitz. The surviving Metropolitan Police files allow a detailed view of investigative procedures in the Victorian era.